states this way anyway. All right, well, we're in the last section of the, uh, of the Olivet Discourse, and uh, I'm just going to read the text, and we'll kind of go back and go, hey, what, what is this all about? You know, he's talking about a judgment, who's being judged, when are they being judged, and so forth, and we'll go through, ask some basic questions about the text and, and go through it, and then come back and review a little bit where we've uh, kind of come from, from verse 1 of chapter uh, 24. Uh, verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from, uh, from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in a prison and come to you? And the king will answer to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, very key phrase, uh, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed, uh, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into uh, eternal life. So obviously there's a judgment that's going on here. So the idea, the question is we're going to answer is uh, when is the judgment going to come? Where it will it be and who's being judged? Well, the, the timing of, of the judgment is uh, important to note. And the first thing we want to note that it's, this is not talking about the white throne judgment. Uh, the, this judgment takes place here on earth. After what we call the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth, Revelation 19, a series of events unfolds, uh, destroys the armies of, uh, of the Antichrist there on the plains of Megiddo, then uh, goes uh, at, uh, uh, to uh, Petra or uh, Basra in the Hebrew uh, down in uh, southern Jordan to rescue the, uh, the remnant of Jewish believers that have cried out to Jesus uh, to uh, uh, confess their sin. Uh, and see him as their Messiah. Uh, he then comes back, stands on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two and so forth. So there's a whole series of events that happen when Jesus returns uh, back to planet Earth. Uh, and then there's a period or a time of judgment that begins. Uh, that's the judgment that's taking place here. It's on Earth. Uh, it's before the millennial kingdom. He's saying, enter now into the kingdom. The kingdom isn't here yet. It's about ready to, uh, to begin. The white throne judgment takes place in space somewhere. Uh, the heavens and the earth will, uh, you know, flee away and so forth. So uh, uh, a different a different judgment. The judgment here in Matthew 25, again, before the kingdom is established, uh, the white throne judgment will take place after the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ here uh, on planet earth. Now, Daniel gives us, actually a time frame. The whole, uh, in Daniel 9, we talk about the tribulation being three and a half years, three and a half years, divided uh, uh, in the middle. The tribulation, we know, begins when the, uh, the Antichrist signs a covenant agreement for a seven-year period uh, so that the Jewish people can uh, restore and rebuild the temple. Uh, and we've, uh, it's been a while, but uh, it was uh, not that long ago, maybe only a few years ago, that the United Nations um, and the European Union jointly together appointed a person with the task of going about to set up seven-year covenant agreements uh, with, with countries, uh, and in particular on behalf of the uh, European Union. 
And that certainly caught our attention when they, when they did that uh, and then gave uh, this one person uh, over the European Union uh, the, the right uh, to be able to do that. And in an emergency situation, basically, uh, the European Union, in terms of the military at their disposal, would be at his disposal and so forth. So uh, they empowered this one particular individual. We're kind of watching him for a while. Uh, and he's kind of, his name was Javier Solano, and he's just kind of faded, <laughs> faded into black. He's kind of gone into retirement. It's like, oh, that could be the guy. What was the resolution they passed to uh, enable him to do that? Resolution 666. We thought that was also <laughs> very interesting. It was like, well, let's kind of watch this guy for a while. But uh, nothing ever really came of it. Uh, but that's still there. Uh, uh, goal of the European Union, uh, grow in power and strength uh, and be able to have a delegator or a delegation to be able to sign seven-year uh, covenant agreements with other countries. Well, that's going to happen uh, under the Antichrist. It's, go it's going to be a seven-year period. And then in the middle, of course, the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped as God in that temple. Uh, and we entered the second half of the tribulation. Uh, we'll talk more about that because it has to do with the, the judgment here. Uh, but Daniel, in Daniel 12, last couple of verses of, of Daniel's prophecy uh, say this. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, uh, and there's our phrase again, and the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. So that's a little different than chapter 9. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you uh, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance uh, at the end of the days. So again, the tribulation itself, seven-year period, 1,260 days. Daniel gives us two other figures here. One, 1,290 days, and the 1,335 days. Uh, the person here is, uh, that's promised a blessing is not the person who can make it to the end of the tribulation. It's the person who can make it to the end of the full period, 1,335 days. So we have an extended 30-day period, uh, period, period at the end of the tribulation. Again, Jesus Christ comes back, those events I talked about. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and there's a 30-day period where it seems like the sacrifices uh, are continuing. We have a 45-day period uh, uh, on top of that together, making for 75 days post or past the tribulation period, but before the millennial kingdom of Christ begins. And this event occurs during that, that time period. Uh, so there's a seven-year period. Christ comes back, destroys the, the, uh, the forces, the Antichrist, rescues the remnant uh, uh, Jewish people, you know, goes to Jerusalem, stands on the Mount of Olives, and then there is a period of time for 75 days before the millennial kingdom uh, actually begins. The judgment that we're talking about here is not the white throne judgment. It's the judgment that takes place uh, during that period of time. Again, there, uh, there are some other events that, that occurred that are mentioned here, and I just want to run through them. Uh, pretty quickly, you, there, there are six that occur during this period of time. So, so again, got a seven-year period, a 75-day period, and then the millennial 1,000-year reign of Christ. And then after that, eternity. So uh, those are the time periods we're, we're, we're looking at. Uh, again, these are the events that take place. One, uh, according to Daniel, the abomination that causes desolation apparently continues for 30 more days. Uh, that's in verse 11 uh, of the Daniel 12 passage where it says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So um, don't ask me why. If it were me, I wouldn't do it this way. But... Uh, it says that the uh, image of the Antichrist remains in the temple for 30 more days. I don't know why, but that's, that's what Daniel says is going to happen. And then that temple that the Jewish people have been rebuilt, uh, that now has been uh, uh, basically desecrated by the image uh, of the Antichrist himself will be completely destroyed uh, at the end of that 30-day uh, period. Also taking place during this time period, uh, the Antichrist is dealt with. 
That's over in Revelation 19.20, where it says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now keep in mind that the, uh, the Antichrist is destroyed along with his forces when Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth, Revelation 19. Uh, therefore, the Antichrist uh, is going to be resurrected so that he can be judged and be cast alive uh, into the lake of fire. Uh, in the same way that Jesus Christ becomes the first fruit of all believers who died and he rose again, becomes the, the, the pattern for all of us that are being saved, uh, therefore, the same way, the Antichrist is going to die. He's going to be resurrected by God so he can be cast, be judged, and be cast into the lake of fire. And that becomes the first fruits or the pattern for everyone that has rejected Jesus Christ uh, as their Lord and Savior. They're going to follow him in uh, to, uh, to that place. Uh, the third event that takes place during this time period, the false prophet is dealt with. Again, false prophet false Holy Spirit during the tribulation period, uh, uh, he is cast into the lake of fire as well. We mentioned, again, this idea of an unholy trinity during the tribulation. You have a false antichrist, you have a, a false prophet, and you have Satan uh, all working in concert together to deceive the world. Uh, so uh, during, uh, during this period of time, uh, during the millennial period, that thousand-year reign, uh, there are only two individuals that are in the lake of fire, and that is the false prophet uh, and the Antichrist. So what happens to Satan? I knew you would ask that question. So number four, Satan is cast into the abyss, Revelation 21 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released uh, for a little while. Notice it's just a common angel that is able to come down and, uh, and bind Satan. He is put in a place... Uh, the bottomless pit is which it's called. It's a temporary abode. He's there for a thousand years, at, uh, at which at the end of that time period, then he is released uh, and is able to come back and have opportunity to deceive the people that have repopulated the earth uh, during the tribulation. I don't think that's a good idea either. I'm just saying that because I think some people are actually going to be deceived. Which will be really weird, won't it? I mean, we're we're good, you know, we're we're just there in a resurrected body, ruling, reigning with Christ. But it's just really odd, don't you think? Jesus is sitting on a literal throne, literally ruling from Jerusalem on the throne of David with an <laughs> with a with an iron scepter. That means nobody gets away with anything because he knows everything. Uh, and uh, therefore, there's, there's peace in the world. Everybody is peaceful, prosperous. Things roll along for a thousand years and so forth. Uh, and to think that people would uh, re rebel against him uh, at the end of that time period is, uh, uh, is amazing. But of course, it uh, amazes us probably that we were deceived for a long period of time as well, as well as those that are around us that haven't come to faith in Christ yet as well. But that's what happens to, to Satan. So during this time period, we're talking about these 75 days in total. There are several things that, that are going on, several things that are happening. But the false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan are all being dealt with. Then you have the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection of three groups of believers. Old Testament saints, church aid saints, tribulation saints. And Paul says there is a sequence to this resurrection in terms of, uh, of events from 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23, I'm reading where he says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Just a euphemism for, for being dead. For since by man came death, by man, capital M, 
also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruit, fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. So see there verse 23, each one in his own order. It's a military term. Uh, it's used for soldiers that are giving uh, marching orders. It means a sequence of events. So there's a sequence of events uh, to the resurrection in terms of uh, the bodily resurrection for three groups of people. Old Testament saints, church age believers, us guys, uh, and then, of course, those that come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period, uh, which there'll be, um, there'll be uh, many. Uh, and uh, again, uh, Jesus is the first fruits of that. Uh, the sixth thing that, uh, that happens uh, during this time period, the 75 days uh, mentioned by Daniel, is the judgment of the Gentiles who survive the tribulation. And that's what our judgment is here. And we'll go back and talk about that a little more now. Uh, again, uh, what we don't know uh, is the order of those events. Those are six events that are going to take place during that 75-day period. And, and uh, I don't know that we know anywhere in Scripture where it actually gives some sequence. This is going to happen, then this, and then this, and so forth. Uh, either way, uh, all those things are enumerated, and they all take place during that, uh, that time period. So the timing of the judgment here from uh, Matthew 25 uh, is, again, at the end of the tribu tribulation, but before the millennial reign of Christ. We've got to go to Daniel to find out how many days it is, and he tells us at the end of chapter 12. Uh, and we've got to go through a series of passages to find out the six events that occur during that, that time period. Secondly, the people involved in the judgment. The judgment uh, involves individuals. Uh, in Matthew 25, 32, the term uh, nations is used there, typically meaning uh, Gentiles, but in this case, it's in a neuter gender, uh, gender in the Greek, so it's, uh, it doesn't mean uh, all, the, all of the Germans will be judged, then all the French will be judged, then all the Spanish. No, uh, it means all the Gentile nations, the, the, the Gentiles from the nations, but it's an individual judgment. Uh, they're not judged uh, in terms of groups. Or, or uh, but rather as individuals. This judgment is first mentioned in Joel chapter three, verse one and two. Uh, Joel writes there, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will uh, also gather all nations or all the Gentiles and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. They have cast lots for my people and have given a boy as a payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Uh, so again, uh, Joel is saying that there is going to be a period of time when uh, Gentiles, uh, and we know from Matthew's gospel, it's not nation by nation or ethnic group by ethnic group, but it's individually, and they're going to get judged. They're going to get judged for very certain things. How they behaved, how they treated the Jewish people specifically, uh, and more specifically, uh, during the tribulation period. Notice what's uh, happened uh, during that time period. Again, it's the, from the middle of the tribulation to the end, there's an all-out holocaust against the, the Jewish peace, people uh, by the Antichrist uh, and his forces. And during that time period, it'll be obviously a very desperate time for the entire world. Keep in mind, by the time we get to the end of the tribulation, two-thirds of the people on the planet have been killed just by these cataclysmic events that are coming, the judgments of God. Among them also, two-thirds of the Jewish people have been killed uh, they've been killed by many of those same events, but also because of the uh, persecution against them. Uh, notice whom they have scattered among the nations. Uh, the land of Israel is going to get divided. Well, we're seeing that even in our day. Uh, and the last one is, uh, is very sobering, but maybe uh, a little easier to understand <coughs> because of uh, current events around us today. The Jews are sold into slavery. 
That's what it says when they have cast lots for my people. They've sold them. Uh, they sold them into slavery. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's worse than that. A boy is a payment for a harlot. A girl is sold uh, for wine that they may drink and so forth. Uh, so the, the Jewish people all the way down to the children uh, are involved in sex trafficking. They're sold as slaves. It's just a horrible period of time uh, for, the, for the Jewish people. Therefore, every Gentile that survives the tribulation will be judged on whether they participated or refused to participate uh, in, in those things. They were either some, uh, pro-Semitic or they were anti-Semitic. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and again, I, I mean, I'm just kind of, uh, of course, with ISIS and everything that's going on, we'd look at that and go, man, I can't believe, I can't believe they'll be selling them as slaves. Are you kidding? They're, they're killing them. I mean, you look at what's going on and, uh, in the Middle East today with ISIS uh, butchering little kids uh, in, in the streets along with their parents and so forth. Uh, just um, so barbarian, it's uh, just incredible. I've just uh, been reading more about uh, uh, Hamas in, in terms of their tunnels and so forth. Uh, they would uh, hire guys, Palestinians, who are real victims in all this, of course, being held by Hamas. They would hire Palestinians uh, and then pay them 150 to, uh, to uh, $300 a month to, uh, to dig the tunnels. They would pick the guys up, blindfold them, uh, and then take them to a site like under a mosque, under a school, under a residential building where the tunnel would begin, and they would dig 8 or tw 12 hours. When they're done, they would blindfold them, take them back home again so they could keep all the tunnels secret. But if during uh, the period of the time of digging them over the last two years when it's been happening, uh, if they ever had a scent or got a rumor that there might be an Israeli spy among them, they would just kill them all. They'd just shoot them all and kill them, uh, rather than the secret get out about the tunnels and so forth. Just very, very brutal people. Uh, some of the Palestinians uh, during one of the ceasefire uh, had a little demonstration against Hamas. They just went down and killed them all. Just not going to be able to do that here. Uh, there's this, it's uh, unbelievable. So when we read... Uh, during the second half of the tribulation, what happens to the Jewish people who basically are duped in by the Antichrist, uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't take much of a stretch of the imagination to understand how this could happen. Well, there's horrific things happening uh, in the world, uh, even, uh, even as we speak. I was watching uh, a ridiculous little video clip of some uh, people in, in a grocery store somewhere on the mainland uh, and they were they walk in and they carry all these Palestinian flags, uh, and they go in the, and they have basically gone online and checked the, uh, this large grocery chain to see what products they carry on their shelves that are made in Israel. They took shopping carts and they raked them off the shelves, anything that Israel made, and thrown them in the, in these shopping carts. I don't know if they're going to take them out back in the dumpster, but they've got they're protesting and so forth. And I. I what cracked me up is they're all Howleys. I mean, I understand if they're, these are Muslims or whatever, but it's like, man, I don't, I don't know what news you're watching or what Kool-Aid you're drinking, but uh, you know, they're our friends, they're democracy. You're supporting a terrorist organization. It's just, uh, uh, it's uh, unbelievable what's, uh, uh, what's going on. Uh, in terms of the, but it will be a horrific time uh, in this whole judgment here that Jesus is talking about here uh, is a judgment because of, during the second half of the tribulation, Gentiles individually are judged because they were either they either helped the Jewish people or they didn't, and and that's uh, going to make a determination who goes into the uh, into the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, the judgment, uh, the judge of the judgment, number three. Well, that's Jesus. We see that in verse thirty-one when it begins the passage when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. Jesus is the one uh, doing the judgment here. And again, there are three groups of people mentioned uh, in the judgment. We've got sheep, we've got goats, and we've got brethren. So who are the people that the king calls my brethren? Well, the brethren, it seems likely that they're believing Jews from the tribulation. Uh, they've heard the message of the gospel from the 144,000 uh, that are uh, have uh, sealed by God so they can't be killed or destroyed by the Antichrist forces. 
Uh, and, uh, and of course, we've got an angel in heaven proclaiming the gospel. Uh, we've got uh, Elijah uh, who will come uh, before, uh, before uh, Jesus returns, also, uh, again, predicted by, by Malachi. Uh, and as uh, more than a few Jewish rabbis have said today, if Elijah shows up, tells me that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, I'll believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, and, uh, and there will be those brethren that hear the message of the gospel and turn to Christ uh, during that uh, time period. There will also be, of course, we mentioned the remnant that's in Petra or Basra being cared for by God. Since these believing Jews will not, will not receive the mark of the beast, they will be unable to buy or to sell. How can they survive during that time period? The remnant's going to be taken care of by God supernaturally. It's the other Jews that are in the world that have been spread into the world. Uh, that uh, how can they survive? And there's only one way, and that's through the loving care of Gentiles who have trusted Christ during that time period, understand the scriptures, and understand the need to care for uh, the Jewish people during during that time. Again, the interesting thing about the judgment is that it's uh, it's the sheep uh, you know, again individuals. Uh, that are surprised at what they hear. It's just their natural response, uh, like uh, uh, during the, the era of Nazism and the Holocaust, uh, the Gentiles that did uh, reach out to the Jewish people. They weren't enough, of course, uh, but there were many, uh, and in some cases, entire towns uh, that reached out to, to the Jews to try to save them. Uh, I don't think they thought they were doing anything heroic at the time, uh, and apparently the response of these Gentiles uh, during this time period that survived, somehow survived the tribulation uh, that helped the Jewish people. When Jesus says to them, uh, you did these things for me, and they're like, when? when? When did we do these things for you? And he goes, hey, it's when you did it for these guys, the least of these, uh, my brethren. Uh, their motive was not a reward. Uh, it was simply sacrificial love, putting their own lives on the line uh, as they welcome homeless Jews in and care for them during the second half of the tribulation period. Verse 40, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it uh, to one of the least of these, my brethren, uh, you did it to me. Again, so it's uh, the sheep Gentiles that make it to the 1,335th day and enter into uh, the millennial kingdom. They will repopulate the Gentile nations uh, during that millennial kingdom. Sometimes people wonder, okay, if we're going to rule and reign with Christ and, you know, Jesus comes back and he wipes out the Antichrist and, you know, everybody takes the mark uh, of the beast, you know, I mean, they're, man, they are doomed for all eternity. So, so how do you get people on the earth, you know, during the millennial reign? Well, this is how you get them. Uh, it's the ones that, uh, that survive, don't take the mark of the beast, and are actually end up caring uh, for the Jewish people that are being persecuted. Uh, fifth, uh, the reason some are given a negative judgment. Now, the, the individual designated as goats, as you might imagine, is not a good connotation. Uh, they did not trust Christ, uh, and um, uh, we know that they never trusted Christ as their Savior uh, by the evidence of the fact that they never cared for his, uh, his brethren. So, uh, again, they apparently have received the mark of the beast. They took care of themselves. They took care of their own needs. And uh, they did not care for or do anything for the Jewish remnant that was suffering on the earth uh, at the time. We would say these are sins of, of omission, uh, which are certainly the same as sins of commission. Not doing good is the moral equivalent of doing evil uh, in this case. Six, the contrast between the two judgments. When we care, uh, compare the two judicial judgments or sentences uh, in Matthew 25, 34, and 41, uh, there's a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, the sheep were blessed of, of the Father, but it never says that the goats were cursed of the Father. It, it, it just says the, the sheep were, were, uh, were blessed. Uh, the sheep inherit the kingdom, and the inheritance is based on birth uh, because they've been born again through faith. They've inherited the kingdom. Uh, who has had faith or who's been saved during the tribulation? Again, only true believers are able to have faith in the grace to risk their lives in order to try to help uh, Jewish people. Uh, James says this in James 2.24, this idea of, of uh, being saved and then the impact it should have upon our lives. 
There he says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, then a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Again, we would say, quoting, I believe it's usually attributed to Calvin, uh, that faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. Uh, there's, <laughs> if you get saved, there's some change there. Something happens. And here the evidence of the changed life is helping the Jewish people uh, in the second half of the tribulation. Sure, there were other changes in the life, but that's what's in focus in the judgment here of Matthew uh, 25. The kingdom was prepared for saved individuals, 2541. Uh, it doesn't, it never states that the everlasting fire was prepared for the, for the goats. <laughs> it was prepared for uh, the devil and his angels, Revelation 20, 2010. The sheep are ushered into the kingdom to share in Christ's glory. Uh, the church is, we're already there, ruling and reigning with Christ. Israel will enjoy then at that point in time the fulfillment of all the promises made through all the prophets. Any promises that God has ever made to the nation of Israel are going to come to pass. Paul makes that uh, uh, very clear in Romans 9, 10, uh, and 11. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, they will have a king that will sit on the throne of David, and he will rule forever and ever. And all the other promises to them that have not been completed to this juncture will all happen during the millennial reign uh, of Jesus Christ or the messianic uh, reign. All of creation gets to share in the glorious liberty of God's uh, children as well, according to Paul in Romans 8, 19 to 21. So Jesus ruling uh, and reigning uh, there uh, in Jerusalem. So that's that kind of ends the, uh, the Olivet uh, Discourse. Now take out your pens and your pen paper because we're going to have our test now. No midterm, no paper, but there is a final. Uh, let's review a little bit. Anyway, the Olivet Discourse. Uh, going back a couple of weeks, the signs of the coming sign. In chapter 24, in the ver uh, first 14 verses, uh, we said there were six of them. And I'm going to give you a hint. They all start with C. They're so nice to help you memorize those for the test. Uh, we said that there, there were signs, uh, again, that will be happening uh, during, during the tribulation, uh, signs leading up to the tribulation. Uh, these are the kind of things that are typically discussed uh, at prophecy conferences. Uh, if you uh, uh, listen to um, Don Stewart, uh, whoever's with him on his channel once a week uh, there on Thursday, they give a prophecy uh, Middle East update. And these are the things that are usually discussed. Uh, there are six of them, the signs of the coming sign. Uh, one, they'll be religious. Starts with a C. Crazy people, that's not it. They'll be religious. It's like pretenders, but it starts with a C. Counterfeits, there we go. They'll be religious counterfeits. Shazam, it should pop up. Maybe it will later. Two. There will be political and military conflicts. That's right. The physical conditions will deteriorate, certainly here, here on planet Earth and so forth. Uh, we said there'll be a, and again, constant persecution uh, of the Jewish people. Uh, and, uh, uh, and again, the... I, I mean, I, I watch these things all the time, and I'm still appalled at some of the stuff that's going on in, uh, in Europe right now in terms of the uh, anti-Semitism. It's just bad, and it's just blatant, and it's like people don't care, you know, if they're going to be called racist or anything else. It's just uh, so out there, but it's going to be worse. But these are all signs uh, that uh, we're, getting, we're getting close. And then five, there is worldwide crazy stuff, chaos. Worldwide chaos going on. And six, there will be the final sign uh, before he comes. Now, final sign uh, is worldwide preaching that's going to take place. Now, these are signs that take place during the tribulation. Uh, but again, uh, the key there is that these signs are like birth pains leading up to the event. So they, these signs are going to be occurring, uh, and they are going to get closer uh, in the time period, like a, a woman in labor, and closer and greater in terms of, or in that case, pain before the birth, um, greater in terms of uh, uh, the impact that they're having. So 
Uh, again, when usually uh, at a prophecy conference or something, uh, maybe the end times outreach you'll hear about, if people talk about how close are we, is these six things they're going to talk about. They're going to talk about the uh, military conflict, the world in chaos, the violence, people being lovers of themselves and not lovers of God, and, uh, and so forth. So we looked at that a few weeks ago. Uh, then in verse 15 to 28, the predictions that will lead to the sign that will be seen by uh, every everyone, and we said that they were uh, were three of them. One of them is that Daniel's prediction uh, is completed. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation, uh, it will be seven years long, and then it will be completed. Uh, again, uh, the Second uh, uh, Thessalonians two one to twelve indicates that the Antichrist can't be revealed, and this thing really get going until the restrainer. Uh, is taken out of the the midst. Uh, And we said the restrainer is the church. Uh, And you can imagine, uh, even in our own country, how different this country would be. We're getting kind of crazier all the time, certainly. Uh, And there's lots of, uh, of, um, uh, you know, persecution uh, against Christians now. The Navy just took out all the Gideon Bibles out of their lodges this last week, you know, because we don't want to offend anyone. You know, all this stuff is going on. Uh, there was just uh, uh, a uh, senior master sergeant, 25 years in, uh, in the army, uh, that basically got forced into retirement because at his uh, promotion ceremony, he served Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Well, that was a political statement, Chick-fil-A sandwiches. I mean, it's just really crazy, the stuff that's, uh, uh, that's going on uh, in the world uh, uh, today. But uh, without Christians in this country, you can imagine what this country would be like. Uh, it, it would be horrible. You can imagine worldwide taking every believer out of, uh, we're talking even <laughs> even uh, nominal believers, but every person that's been born again by God's Spirit, all removed from planet Earth in the twinkling of an eye, it will have a huge impact. We are a restraining force uh, here on planet Earth. We say the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer in the church is removed. Is the Holy Spirit still at work? You betcha. There's a worldwide evangelistic campaign that takes place that is uh, unprecedented, unbelievable during that time period. And um, I was just uh, uh, online on on my phone, uh, being a patient husband. Kathy was shopping at Walmart the other day and uh, reading uh, reading an article, a guy, and and he he, he was... uh, a pretty, a pretty noted guy, and, he, and, uh, and I, I hear people say this, and I'm not really sure what they're thinking. And they're saying that the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from the earth during this time period. I'm sorry, that's very bad theology. The Holy Spirit is God. Uh, he is the third person of the Trinity, and he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing, and he is all-present. You can't take him out of some place. Uh, but we can say that, uh, that uh, the church, the Holy Spirit in the life of the church, is removed. Uh, he is the restrainer, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 1 to 12. Uh, secondly, Jesus' prediction uh, has brought great confusion that there in verse 15 of chapter 24. Whoever reads, get a grip. No, it says whoever reads, let him understand. But that's the idea. Get a grip, you know, because... Uh, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot, there's going to be confusion over this whole idea of prophecy, in other words. And we've got replacement theology, uh, and we've got, you know, upwards of 80% of Christians around the world that don't even believe a word of what we've been studying the last couple of weeks because they base all their theology on Augustine uh, in the 4th century uh, and his, what he had to say uh, about prophecy uh, and uh, in terms of uh, it says this, but it really means this. Everything becomes an allegorical statement, uh, never taken literally true, uh, that holds on through Roman Catholicism, even through all the Reformed churches, uh, and uh, is a big issue uh, today. Three, Jesus' predict, uh, prediction was for a, a current generation. Uh, in Luke 21, uh, 20 to 24, uh, we talked about how the believers... Uh, there in 70 A.D., just prior to 70 A.D., uh, knew the teaching of Jesus. When they saw the city surrounded, uh, Jesus said, get out of Dodge, Jerusalem in this case. Uh, And again, when the uh, Roman legions withdrew uh, and went back to the Mediterranean to resupply, uh, that particular general was was killed. They had to wait for Titus to arrive 
They come back to Jerusalem, laid siege to the city, uh, and burned it to the ground, kill uh, 1.3 million Jewish people in the city in 70 AD. But before they could get back over there, because of this teaching, uh, 100,000 uh, what we'd call Messianic Jewish people that were living in Jerusalem said, Jesus said, when you see the city around it, you better get out of here. They saw it surrounded, lay siege to. When the Romans pulled away, they hightailed it out, according to Josephus, got across the Jordan, out into the Jordan plain, uh, and they uh, survived because they heeded the warnings uh, of this teaching uh, of the Olivet Discourse. Uh, again, uh, the purpose of, of the sign that we've been looking at, though, these things, these six things leading up to the sign of Jesus returning, uh, we said a few weeks ago, was meant to be an encouragement to the Jewish believers in the second half of the tribulation, also called the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, because uh, they're able to see these things are happening, everything is happening, it's okay, God is sovereign, he's going to take care of us, we need to hang on to the end, it's all going according to plan. Secondly, the sign is the promise of, of survival. Uh, Jesus closed the section of the discourse with three practical admonitions built around three illustrations. The fig tree, uh, again, when you see the fig tree blossom, know that summer is near. When you see these things happening, know that it's about ready to happen. You see these signs, it looks really bad. It's okay, the Messiah is coming back. Hang in there for the three and a half year period that Daniel prophesied. Then in verse 20, 36 of chapter 24, we saw a Last week, there's the but, but in contrast to that illustration, he gives two other illustrations about a time when no one knows the day or the hour. Noah and a thief in a night, both are illustrations, we said, of the rapture of the church. Verse 37, but as in the days of Noah were. Then he gives all these illustrations, five exhortations in regards to the rapture, uh, and they are all given in the form of parables, uh, and most of them exhorted us to do two things. What were we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to, oh, you got it. Watch and pray. Awesome students. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. And then after that, the, the judgment that we just uh, so that's the Olivet Discourse. And um, aren't you glad we didn't cover it all in one week? <laughs> but uh, it is a lot of information. Uh, it is interesting because uh, it's easy to, uh, you know, forget those five exhortations and not watch and pray. It's easy to get busy and caught up uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in this life and uh, in everything uh, and forget the Lord is coming for us and could come. Uh, it uh, at any time and it just needs to be something that's kind of always there in the uh, in the back of our minds in, in a sense to realize when I'm planning when I'm making decision and again you can go through and read those later or go through our notes later uh, it, uh, Jesus is not saying that uh, sell everything you've got put on a, a uh, white robe and go to the highest mountain around you and wait for the rapture as uh, as uh, some have done that's how the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church got started by the way uh, the Millerites actually did that under Miller and uh, uh, waited for the, of course, he didn't come. And uh, then it was like, okay, well, probably need something more than a white robe here. Sure wish we hadn't sold the farm. Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, I was trying to think of the gal's name. Ellen, Ellen G. White says, well, I'll lead you, brother, and follow me. And she starts the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But... Uh, uh, that's not what the exhortation is. It's uh, occupy till he comes, but have that in your mind in terms of priorities and how you live your life, decisions that you make, uh, the need to get the gospel out, uh, and uh, the urgency about what we do uh, for, for the Lord, to watch and to pray. No one knows the day or, or the hour. Well, do you have any questions? We don't always do that, but do you, do you have any questions? If they're really hard, Cyril's going to take them afterwards. But if they're easy, I'll take them right now. Cyrus, excuse me. King Cyrus. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Sure, sure. Because it, yeah, it's something people people uh, uh, don't don't actually. They kind of look at those end of Daniel and go, I think he got his numbers wrong there. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't know what to do with those numbers because they don't really match what he said in chapter nine. So it's like we're not going to talk about that. You know, that they don't really say that, but that's kind of how it comes out. But uh, yeah, so so there's this thing, and he he really describes and pinpoints the 1,260 days uh, in terms of the. Uh, uh, the tribulation, but then, then at the very, this is a, if you go to Daniel and, you know, I'm giving you the verses here, but if you look them at it, why, this is like the last thing he says uh, in verse uh, 11, chapter 12, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, that's, and the abomination of desolation is set up, so that's in the middle of the tribulation, there shall be 1,290 days, it's like, oh, okay, so we got an extra 30 days, uh, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Uh, okay, so now we've got, you know, another another figure there. Uh, but you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and arise to your inheritance at the end uh, of the days. Uh, so, it, so the blessing uh, in terms of those that make it through the tribulation, it's not just to make it through, because you can make it through the tribulation and then, you know, two-thirds of the people on the earth get killed. But you make it to the end. Sorry, you're a goat. You're being judged anyway. It's <laughs> ah, ah, sorry, it's not enough. You know, it's to make it to the 1,335 uh, that you actually went through it, didn't take the mark. You know, it's just interesting how they got all that now. You know, the little chip, they're all ready to go. <laughs> got scanners for you down at Walmart. Put your hand on there. And uh, they're all ready for it. And... Uh, uh, but it, you got to not take the mark. You got to survive the cataclysmic stuff that's going on uh, around you, uh, and uh, and because of your faith in Christ, uh, you're going to be uh, helping Jewish people as evidence of your faith, and you're going to be blessed because you make it uh, all the way to the end. Now, why is there a distinction with the thirty versus the uh, the ninety, basically? And uh, we said there are six events that occur during that time period, and, and we don't really know the order. I mean, you've got resurrection, you've got the Satan being judged, you've got all these things, and we don't really know the order. What we do know, apparently, is that, uh, that uh, for that first 30, it's 30 days before that temple where the Antichrist set up that false image of himself is destroyed by God. I don't know why there's a 30-day wait. If it were me... I come down the Mount of Olives, that baby splits in two, I just go, you're dead, that's gone, you're gone, that thing is gross, you're out of here, but uh, didn't check with me on that one, and uh, I guess it'll all be self-evident, you know, it'll be one of those, oh, oh yeah, I knew that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, there'll be a lot of stuff like that, you know, we're just like, oh, I see, you know, so there's a 30 day, and then that thing is destroyed. Uh, and there's the, there's that rest of that whole time period where these other events occur, and we and we don't know, you know, the sequence. We just know that there's six of them that will that will take place. But it is something that uh, is not really discussed a lot, you know, that 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 ending to uh, to uh, Daniel's passage, and people just go, well, that's different there. <laughs> How come? But that's why, yeah. Yep. And that's why you, you've got to tie it in with Joel, because uh, he talks about it, and you've got to tie it in with the, the Matthew 25 uh, discourse. But, uh, yeah, good question. All right. Anything else? Okay, well, let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we do just come to you. We thank you for the uh, accuracy of, uh, of your word, and uh, in that you would tell us things that, that would happen in advance. Lord, but uh, not just the things that are yet to come, the things that you've already fulfilled. Uh, therefore, your word is up to this point been 100% accurate in terms of the prophecies. Uh, we have no reason to believe that it will not continue to be 100% accurate uh, into the future. Lord, and uh, so many of these things, again, there's, uh, are, are directed to people that are yet future, uh, and yet, uh, the things that are directed to us, uh, the exhortations to watch and pray, watch and pray five times, Lord, may we heed those words and truly do that. Yes, watch the current events and watch what's going on. Watch what's happening 
in this world, but watch what's happening to our families. Watch what's happening to our, our, our neighborhood, uh, our community. Lord, and then be praying uh, based on what we're seeing and what we're observing uh, with a sense of urgency, knowing that you could come for us, our opportunity to deliver the gospel, our opportunity to live a godly life before others. Well, it's just, it's just a short period and we don't know when it's going to end. So Lord, help us to do these things that we might have an impact uh, on those that truly we love, we care about, would be in the kingdom with us one day ruling and reigning during this time period uh, we've just discussed. Lord, so we thank you for your grace that saves us. Uh, none of us could ever earn our salvation. It's by, it's by your love. In fact, Lamentation 3.22 says, uh, you know, it, it's, it's only by your love that we're not consumed. And uh, we're so thankful that uh, of your faithfulness that is new to us uh, every morning. So we praise you for that. Lord, so bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.